And welcome to Multi-Level Mondays, a weekly series all about pyramid schemes, Ponzi schemes, multi-level marketing, and other forms of business fraud. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're gonna get into Kirby vacuums. Now, Kirby is yet another MLM with some pretty questionable ethics, as is the case with MLMs in general. I can't say I've ever done a video on a vacuum MLM though, so this is gonna be an interesting one for sure. But hey, let's cut to the chase and get right to the good stuff. Let's learn about the history of Kirby vacuums. Now, Kirby vacuums have been around for quite some time, longer than many MLMs we've discussed previously. James or Jim Kirby was the inventor and he was born in September, 1884. According to one source, growing up, Jim Kirby watched his mother at her endless round of housekeeping chores. He thought that women were stuck spending way too much time on monotonous drudgery and that much of their repetitive work could be replaced by electrical appliances. With that goal in mind, he began designing and building such devices. Many people have heard of Kirby vacuum cleaners, but that was just one company that decided to name one branch of their operations after Kirby. Kirby also invented improvements to electronic dishwashers, irons, and washing machines. Kirby invented the first practical spin cycle for washing machines. Prior to Kirby's mass-produced laundryette, women had to haul heavy laundry, soaking wet clothes out of the wash tub and through a wringer. Kirby eventually amassed over 150 patents, most involving laundry or vacuum cleaners. But there was a sprinkling of marvelously unrelated sparks of genius, air conditioners, a fishing reel, a lake, etc. By age 35, Kirby had made his fortune. So first of all, Kirby, thank you so much for inventing the washing machine spin cycle. Seriously, uh, thank you. That's very cool. And that's something I would not have guessed and MLM would have been behind. And I think that's a really neat little fact. Anyway though, Kirby had been making vacuums and household inventions for some time, and the first one to carry his name was introduced in the 1930s when the Kirby division of Scott & Fetzer launched. Scott & Fetzer, of course, being a well-known manufacturer of home products, Kirby himself passed away in the early 70s, dying a wealthy man with a legacy as the man who revolutionized the American home. Unfortunately, whether these vacuums are incredible or not, and we'll get into the product reviews later, the method in which they're sold is less than ideal. The Kirby company has been using direct selling since the 1920s, relying on in-home demonstrations to sell their product. Now, before anyone comes for me, I do think that Kirby, as well as some other older MLMs out there like Avon, did give women an opportunity to work when options may have been slimmer. Many direct sellers, at least in the 60s, were women, and it was seen as a good job for busy mothers. Though some may call it an employment opportunity, and in the early 1900s, those terms may have been more accurate for women entering the workforce. When you look at the statistics and earnings behind MLM jobs today, you're often better off just working a part-time minimum wage job literally anywhere else. Unfortunately, Kirby has remained an MLM even when it's brought them countless criticisms, But before we get into the MLM itself, let's talk about their products. Are their vacuums any good? Kirby vacuums in of themselves have gotten positive reviews online. Great Vax has said they're better than the Dyson in terms of suction and Vacuums Guide has said that Kirby Avalair 2 has incredible versatility and is energy efficient, though the price is incredibly inflated and it's pretty loud. On consumer affairs, the reviews are pretty mixed, leaving Kirby at about three stars. Some of the reviews call it well-built and say nothing cleans like a Kirby, while a lot of negative reviews cite disgusting business tactics and distributors that harass them. Honestly, most of the negative reviews were about the distributors, while one of the low ratings was about the vacuum itself, and it said that the power head was difficult to assemble, and another said that there's broke in a short amount of time. Here's a couple of them to give you a sense of what's going on. A Kirby salesman came to my house and left dirty filters all over the floor. When asked if he was going to pick those up, he told me no and left. This was after writing feedback on a form. Up until this point, he was polite and professional. I can provide pictures of the mess as well as the salesman and driver that picked him up from my home. 
Considering the incredibly unprofessional nature of the salesman, I can only imagine what the customer service with the actual machine would be like. Another states, price is way too high. The machine does a great job of cleaning the rug. Lots of power attachments are fair. Repeating myself, this is sold by door-to-door sales and the price is high for that reason. Then a four-star review that reads surprisingly negative says, I recently purchased a new Kirby. I had one several years ago, so I was familiar with the product. This particular machine is very heavy and difficult to maneuver. In order to use the hose attachment, you literally have to take off the vacuum head and put on the hose. This is not very convenient or efficient. I would say that for the price, this is not a good buy. Overall, when it comes to a vacuum, it's you do you a little bit. Like thankfully these aren't supplements or dieting products that could be potentially harmful. It is a vacuum. And that's the point where we're at with multi-level Mondays is that, hey, does this thing not have the potential to really kill you? Then I guess it's not horrific. But anyway, I was able to shop for hoses, filter bags, and cleaners online, just not the vacuum itself. It seems like you would have to schedule a demo in order to buy it. The Kirby website states as much too. On Amazon, as of writing this, the price was well over $1,000, but I can't see the specs or details from the website itself. All I know is that the Wall Street Journal says they can cost $1,500, so that seems a bit overpriced to me. I recently bought, I think it's like the Bissell Spot, pack or the spot pet vac or something like that. And I think that was maybe like 250 or 300 bucks and it is amazing and worth it. And it doesn't come from an MLM. Also just before anyone asks, because I know someone's going to, uh, no Kirby the Nintendo cartoon was not named after Kirby vacuums. Yes, that might have been a stroke of genius. And I had the same thought too about this point in my research, but Kirby was actually named after John Kirby, one of Nintendo's lawyers. So they just happened to share the same last name. Now, unfortunately with their website giving so little information, we're going to move on from products and talk about sales tactics. And who better to ask about this than a former Kirby salesman? So Ali, my main researcher and writer that helps me out with a lot of these videos so that we can put out so many, happens to have a friend named Joel who was willing to share his experience working for Kirby for this video. Now, I obviously won't give away much personal information about Joel except his name. So thank you for at least letting us have that one. And uh, thank you for sharing your story as well. I did have to summarize a little bit, but I tried to avoid that so that nothing was taken out of context. Here's what Joel said about working for Kirby. You see an ad in the paper and it's very vague. It's usually something like, we're hiring for multiple openings, including customer service, setup and display, product demonstration, and team leaders. Depending on the office, you might see the word sales, but it's rare. What's more is that the company is almost never listed as Kirby. For me, it was J Hood Associates. There's a lot of boilerplate language in the interview. You're asked the standard questions about your strengths and weaknesses, which skills you enjoy using, whether you have any managerial experience and so on. It's a conversation designed to make you feel confident in the legitimacy of the company without ever knowing what the company is. And barring any red flags or felony convictions, you're invited to orientation. At orientation, you're finally let in on the secret. You'll be selling Kirby vacuums. They're the best vacuums on the market. I actually still legitimately believe this. And it's the company tradition that they've only ever been sold in Persa via in-home demonstrations. Then you're assured that there's a heap of money to be made in the business. And not just through commission, there's actually a weekly guarantee. At J Hood, the weekly guarantee in 2005 was $500 a week or your commission, whichever was greater. The caveat was that you had to conduct 15 demonstrations every week, verified by your calling in from the customer's home. At face value, this meant three appointments a day, five days a week, and weekends are pretty much non-negotiable. The logic behind this guarantee was that on average, if you were following the script you learned in your training session, one in every three customers would likely be a sale. And even if you only landed one out of every five, your commission would surpass the $500 guarantee. Unfortunately, as you guys can guess, this $500 guarantee wasn't all that accurate. Joel explained that there were two ways to earn these appointments. One was joining the van crew. This was a group of people knocking on doors, telling everyone you're selling vacuums to gain a vacation. That much is true. Kirby did offer trips to the Bahamas like George and more to their top sellers. This is the door-to-door sales aspect of the job. 
But then there's the referral program, the way that we're all more familiar with, asking people if you can perform demonstrations at their homes, signing up others, and those friends and family you know offer you the names and numbers of their own friends and family. Pure Romance has done this, Tupperware, a lot of party MLMs we've discussed in the past all do this. Ideally, this is supposed to give you a long referral chain, but Joel ran into a problem we've seen time and time again. The leads run out and he's left earning far less than that guarantee. As Joel said, by my second month, I was knocking at the doors of empty apartments in the slums, wondering if there was even a chance that this was viable anymore. I had managed to bring home 200 to $250 a week for the first month, which was all right for an 18 year old who was just taking a year to work before college. It was more than I had been making at Walden Books when minimum wage in Massachusetts was still $6.75 an hour. But now I'd reached an impasse. The money wasn't coming in anymore because people had stopped answering their doors. And when they did, even if they were warm and welcoming, what nerve did I have asking someone living in a triple decker to buy a $1,500 appliance? So I had to move on. I started selling Kirby vacuums in January, 2005. And by April, I was a bookseller at Barnes and Noble a more natural fit for me to be sure. And I was assured that I could transfer to the Farmingham location when I started school in the fall. Let me make this abundantly clear. Joel has said that he doesn't look back on his time with hatred and he doesn't hold resentment for the company. Even though he wasn't making the guaranteed income and he was under pressure at that time, I'm not gonna put words in his mouth and say he can't stand Kirby. Not every single former MLMer leaves their job feeling furious, but as Joel is about to tell us, Kirby absolutely had their issues too. I got a call. One of the team leaders for the van crew was unlicensed and needed a driver. He was offering a flat $300 a week salary and thought it might be a better fit for me than sales had been. We left the office every day after the morning meeting, drove up to New Hampshire to knock on doors and usually didn't get back to town until after midnight. One day, I don't remember why, one of the van crew members had a referral appointment in West Boylston, Massachusetts. It seemed the only thing to do was to seek out a nearby neighborhood and get some demos while we were waiting for him. The team started knocking on doors, but some of the residents got suspicious of our slow moving van creeping up and down the street. Soon enough, the police came and made it clear to me why we had been spending all that time in New Hampshire. Most of the van crew held permits that allowed them to sell door to door in New Hampshire. Once you apply, you're cleared until it expires. But Massachusetts requires you to check in at the police station town by town, day by day, and register the names of your team members. We hadn't done that. The police charged us with hawking and peddling without a license. I told them repeatedly that I was only a driver, that I didn't see any merit to my being charged with peddling anything. My defense didn't hold water though. We were laid up for about an hour before we could pick up the fellow who had the appointment. I don't remember how we got the van back so fast. I've often looked back on that time with shame. I augmented my criminal record without ever really telling anybody. My friends kept telling me I wasn't being paid what I deserved, as did my family. I feel shame because of what it must have looked like. Not long after this, Joel became the face of one of the Kirby offices when the man he was driving opened up a Kirby branch in Gardner. This is why I found Joel's story particularly interesting because he wasn't just a distributor that ran into troubles, but he was an interviewer that he admits purposefully wrote misleading ads. He says, I've written those ads. I've hand delivered the copy to the newspaper office. I know why they're as vague as they are. You're trying to attract the misfits. That's what I was and that's why I ended up there. During my gap year alone, I'd worked for four different companies before I found Kirby and I stayed there the longest. It wasn't because I was a good salesman and it wasn't because I believed in the product, although I did and still do. It was because I recognized in those peers a desire to stray away from structure and strictures that had placed them all in those stagnant and lifeless years on their resumes. They may have wanted the money most of all, and it's sad that what needs to be promised in order to give people hope. But I like to think that at least in my small team, we shared the common bond of wanting more than that, of wanting to just belong. Joel says that the people that applied were often hopped from job to job, desperate for something to stick, wide-eyed when they asked him how much he was making. Kirby lured in vulnerable people that needed work, just as many MLMs do. Joel isn't working for an MLM now, don't worry. And I'm not saying he's a horrible person for ever having done so. Ultimately, the reason why I make these episodes is to warn people that are involved with MLMs about the actual nature of what the job is. 
It's a frustrating loop when you're applying for work. People want people with experience, but you can't gain experience if you aren't given a job in the first place. But for Kirby to deliberately target these people, well, it's shady at the very least. Also, how ironic is it that Joel said, barring any felonies, you're invited for an interview, but this job actually put something on his record instead. I'm not saying Joel gained a felony charge because of Kirby. I just think at the bare minimum, they should have informed him more about what his job entails. Yes, I agree ignorance of the law isn't an excuse, but you'd think that Kirby, who encourages door-to-door sales, would at least tell someone that lives in Massachusetts what the Massachusetts sales laws are. I feel like that would be just basic orientation stuff, right? But anyway, thank you, Joel, for being able to give us an inside scoop on what Kirby was like for you. I feel it's pretty rare we get to see an in-depth look from inside an MLM, so I really appreciate Joel coming forward. But now we need to move on to their sales tactics. The Wall Street Journal has an old article about this where they write, in the world of home appliances, Kirby Co. likes to consider its product the Porsche of vacuum cleaners. With a price tag of around $1,500, it also costs more than four times of what other top-of-the-line vacuum cleaners do. Why does a Porsche cost more than a Chevy? Asked Ralph Shea, chief executive officer of Kirby parent Scott Fetzer Co., a unit of Berkshire Hathaway, which is controlled by billionaire Warren Buffett. It's worth noting that luxury car dealers don't make house calls in trailer parks, but Kirby dealers do. After 64 years, the Kirby, there is only one model updated periodically, continues to be marketed exclusively door to door, often to people who can ill afford a $1,500 gadget, but succumb to the sales pitch nonetheless. That has led consumer protection agencies to question the company's tactics. If Kirby really considers itself a name brand and that's why they cost more, all right, they have every right to do that. But Joel himself said that he was selling in the slums, as he said. Gardner, Massachusetts also has a fairly high poverty rate when you compare it to the state of Massachusetts as a whole. If you ask me, I'd say Kirby wasn't popular there because it was expensive, but the office may have been popular because of the people desperate for employment. This simply reeks of that sneaky predatory nature we often see in MLMs today. Now, whether or not it was that pressure that the distributors felt to close in on a pitch or not, many consumer complaints poured in during the early 2000s about the salespeople. One woman, Karen Moosh, said when she told a salesman there was no way she could spend $2,700 on a vacuum cleaner, the salesman's manager showed up and they ganged up on her. Karen was home alone, she felt cornered, and she eventually bought the vacuum after a five-hour sales pitch. At that time, some Kirby salespeople were accused of deceiving people to get into their homes, claiming they won a free carpet cleaning only to stay for six hours. They've targeted the elderly too. Footage as old as 1994 shows independent distributors making fun of how old and sick their customers were. Kirby the company has denounced this thankfully, and some distributors have been made to pay for their actions. But the pressuring intense sales calls continued. A former distributor, Tim Gottschalk, admits that he made thousands of dollars off one elderly woman. Over a 12 month period, she ended up buying 13 different sweepers, he says, adding that he believes the woman who kept trading each Kirby in for what she thought was a newer model had Alzheimer's. Kirby says these kinds of tactics violate company policy, but Gottschalk, Robinson, and other former distributors say these practices reflect the aggressive culture that the company rewards. You don't leave that house until you get the deal, and that's what you're taught, says Robinson, who was forced out of the company in 1997 and sued Kirby in a dispute over pricing, which was later settled out of court. Again, I won't say that all Kirby distributors are like this. However, as is the case with so many MLMs, it becomes a pattern. The company fired 14 people for aggressive sales practices, and complaints continued to stack up. In June, 2004, the Arizona Attorney General filed suit against Kirby distributors for violating the Telemarketing and Consumer Fraud and Abuse Prevention Act, seeking an injunction against any other home sales. The defendants were two distributors who unfortunately didn't really see this affect the company at large. The violations were just what we saw above, knowingly selling vacuums to consumers, including elderly customers who were clearly unable to use the vacuum because it was too heavy for them falsely informing elderly consumers that they can only cancel the sale within three days when elderly consumers can cancel within one year and depriving consumers of the Arizona's Home Solicitation and Referral Sales Act. This hasn't ended as far as I can tell. I hope that 2004 would be the end of it or that the complaints about pushy salespeople would slow down, but I found a 2018 article entitled, Door-to-Door Vacuum Salesmen Take Pushy to a New Level. So you can imagine how that worked out. 
Andy Poirier told the Star Tribune that a salesman spent two hours demonstrating a $2,500 Kirby vacuum cleaner and ignored his request to leave. Then a supervisor showed up and said that the salesman needed one more sale to earn a reward trip, suggesting that Andy should feel bad for wasting his entire night without buying anything. I think I could be just a little bit more forgiving if it were only the salesman making these claims, but as we've heard twice now, it's also managers and supervisors, so clearly this is something that's coming from the higher ups at the Kirby Pyramid. I'm not saying that the CEOs at the tippy top are actively promoting this. I can't know that for sure without hearing their demonstrations or anything, but the supervisors are setting a poor example at the bare minimum here. Aside from the questionable sales tactics and what Joel's revealed to us thus far, there's also been the lawsuits. And now it's time to take a quick break and talk about today's sponsor, HelloFresh. Get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouthwatering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh cuts the stressful meal planning and grocery store trips out of the equation so you can just get to cooking and enjoy dinner on the table in about 30 minutes or less. And they have over 25 recipes to choose from every single week. And it's always changing. It's always something different. It's always exciting when I open the app and see what I get to pick for my upcoming weeks of meals. And they have everything from gourmet burgers, vegetarian meals, and everything in between. And HelloFresh's ingredients are sourced directly from growers and delivered from the farm to your front door in under a week. And it's contact free, of course, too. So if you want to get started with HelloFresh, make sure to go to hellofresh.com 12MLM and use code 12MLM for 12 free meals, including shipping. Again, go to hellofresh.com slash 12 MLM, including the code 12 MLM for 12 free meals, including free shipping. So get started today and get tasty delivered meals right to your door. Now I'm going to put a trigger warning here because it's going to get a little difficult. We're gonna talk about sexual assault. And if you're not in the right place or frame of mind to hear about this, then feel free to skip ahead a couple minutes where you can hear the second lawsuit in this section. Now, unfortunately, during my Cutco video, I talked about a young woman that was sexually assaulted when she went to an older man's home to sell knives. With Kirby, it actually worked the other way around and a salesman assaulted a woman in her home. I understand that in this case, Kirby didn't necessarily endorse their distributor's behavior, but this isn't the only case where Kirby has had this problem. According to one source, in a December 31st, 1998 decision, the Texas Supreme Court described Mickey Carter's relationship as that of an independent contractor subject to a Kirby independent dealer agreement. The Senna Kirby company did not conduct any kind of background check on Carter prior to hiring him. And according to a May 1st, 1997 decision by the Third Court of Appeals in Texas, Kirby did not require its distributors to conduct background checks on prospective dealers. In his employment application with Senna, Carter listed three references and three prior places of employment. The Supreme Court pointed out that had Senna checked it, they would have found that women at Carter's previous places of employment had complained of Carter's sexually inappropriate behavior. Senna would have also found that Carter had been arrested and received deferred adjudication on a charge of indecency with a child, and that one of the previous employer's records indicated that Carter had been fired because of that incident. All this makes me wonder is if this horrific incident, this rape could have been avoided if Kirby had just been vetting people and doing the bare minimum. Kirby was held liable because of this. They were found grossly negligent and faced $160,000 in damages and $800,000 in punitive damages. As glad as I am that there has been some justice for the victim here, it's frustrating that this isn't the only case. The same thing happened in North Dakota. One source states, on December 8th, 1983, McLean let Molachek into her apartment to demonstrate a Kirby vacuum cleaner. Molachek also brought with him a set of knives provided by the distributor as a door opener or gift opening for allowing the in-home demonstration. After beginning the demonstration, Molachek used the knives in assaulting and raping McLean. It sounds like a horrific Cutco Kirby combo here, and I don't know really what else to say about that. Damages were $150,000 in this case. Kirby was also found negligent again, but that doesn't erase what happened. 
Both of these cases were decades ago, so one can only hope that Kirby has learned from all of this and it won't happen again, but it's extremely upsetting that this was ever a thing in the first place, let alone twice. So now let's move on to lawsuit number two. That's also messed up, but not as messed up as the first one, obviously. As you can imagine, given the hours Joel said he worked and the pay he received, many distributors have been furious with Kirby in semi-recent years about minimum wage labor laws. Back in 2010, 12 distributors of Kirby vacuums were cited for violations of the state's wage and hour laws. This was in Massachusetts, the same state Joel was based out of. According to MassLive, violations included non-payment of wage, non-payment of minimum wage, misclassification, child labor, retaliation, and record-keeping violations. Distributors have been fined a total of $199,300 and were ordered to pay restitution. Investigators said 34 salespeople or telemarketers were not properly paid under the state's wage and hour laws. Investigators also discovered that the workers were misclassified and that many did not receive pay stubs. I've got no idea why these sellers seem so common in Massachusetts. There's so many in there and New Hampshire too. I guess it has probably something to do with the sales laws Joel mentioned earlier. Regardless, there's a massive list of distributors from all over the state for violating these labor laws. So it's not like this was some mistake. It was just another pattern. Also, as an aside here, I seriously don't know what it is about Kirby in Massachusetts because as I was doing research on this portion, I found an article in the Boston Globe that says, don't even think of selling CBD as a door-to-door vacuum salesperson. So I guess Kirby sellers in Massachusetts were also commonly selling CBD and hemp products on the side. I don't know what the heck's going on there, but I, I just found it funny for some reason, but anyway. Back to the minimum wage problem. Although I naively hope that these incidents in 2010 may spark some sort of change for Kirby, that's unfortunately not the case. In 2016, an article from Louisiana Record was released accusing Kirby of illegal pay practices. It reads, a mitrary man says he and other door-to-door sales reps for Kirby vacuum cleaners were not paid the statutory minimum wage or for overtime in violation of federal wage laws. Christopher French filed a class action lawsuit on January 11th in U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Louisiana against Louisiana Cleaning Systems Incorporated, Charles Nugent, and the Scott Fetzer Co. doing business as the Kirby Co., alleging violations of the Fair Labor Standards Act. According to the complaint, French answered a Craigslist ad promising $500 a week upon entry into the defendant's training program selling high-end vacuum cleaners door-to-door. Instead, French claims he worked 80 hours for two weeks with no compensation, although he attended mandatory two-hour sales meetings six days a week and canvassed neighborhoods from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. with other trainees. And this sounds like a lot of what Joel was promised too, $500 a week, and he was selling for incredibly long days with half the pay that was promised. Thankfully, Joel was only 18. This was a side hustle, so it didn't truly affect him. But for adults that may struggle to get a job and have more bills to pay or even children to support, a company shouldn't promise them a salary that they aren't going to deliver on, let alone not paying for time worked. The other lawsuits that Kirby have been in are relatively minor. They've dealt with the RICO Act a few times now, the racketeer influenced and corruption organizations for selling already used vacuums as new. Though this was brought against them all the way in 2007, it wasn't resolved until 2011. Kirby has also sued unauthorized dealers several times now, sometimes winning out of court, sometimes not. As for the last bit we're going to cover on Kirby today, it's the numbers. Can you make money with Kirby? Although I can't confidently state exactly how much you'll make because they haven't been released in their income disclosures, I can confidently state that you likely won't make as much as they lead you to believe. Indeed states that the average distributor makes $26,000 a year, which definitely doesn't align with the less than $1,000 Joel made per month. I understand that maybe he didn't make as much as some others would make, maybe he made below average for all I know, but reviews online aren't exactly glowing either. Some say they made $1,000 over a three month span when they worked 12 hour shifts every single day. Another salesperson says he was never paid. You kind of get the idea here. However, because of this price and because 2020 wasn't exactly a great year for door-to-door sales, their business has been on a serious decline. Globe Newswire stated in late 2020 that Kirby Corporation today announced net earnings attributable to Kirby for the third quarter ended September 30th, 2020 of 27.5 million or 0.46 per share, compared with net earnings of 48 million or 0.80 per share for the 2019 third quarter. 
consolidated revenues for the 2023 quarter were 496.6 million compared with 666.8 million reported for the 2019 third quarter. David Grzybinski, Kirby's president and chief executive officer commented, the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated economic slowdown adversely impacted Kirby's businesses during the third quarter. Although general economic activity was slightly improved and increased profitability was realized in the distribution and services segment, the marine transportation businesses experienced lower volumes and barge utilization. Even if Kirby doesn't require an investment for someone to become a salesperson, and even if you can make money doing this, it doesn't mean you're going to. The way that Kirby words this on their website feels incredibly misleading to me as well. Here's what they say. Some, but not all Kirby distributors offer financial incentives to salespeople to demonstrate the vacuum, even if the salesperson doesn't make a single sale. Distributors do this because they know the more the salespeople demonstrate the vacuum, the more likely they are to make a sale. If you interview with a Kirby distributor who offers such a program, make sure you understand all of the requirements you must meet to qualify. It can be hard facing rejection. That's why Kirby salespeople have the opportunity to compete for amazing trips, cars, electronics, and other incentives offered by independent Kirby distributors that encourage sales and build morale. Complete rules and details about these prizes are always available from the independent distributor for your review. So the first sentence to me is kind of like, hey, we won't always pay you for your time going out and demonstrating these vacuums, but some people will, probably just in the states that are suing them for not paying minimum wage really, but that's just my two cents here. Kirby acts like these vacations encourage sales too, and yet their own supervisors have used it to guilt customers into paying for a vacuum they may not even be able to afford. So sure, with Kirby, you're promised $500 a week, But many of these salespeople mention working 12 hour days. And even if you do earn that guaranteed 500, you're still only getting paid $8 an hour, $500 divided by 60 hours. Chances are you'll end up making more by working minimum wage. The only state with the lower minimum wage than $8 is Alabama and Jesus Christ, Alabama, it's 2021, Let's, let's get with it. Generally speaking, I really agree with what the Opportunity Scout has said about Kirby. Though they may not be a scam, certainly not so much as a scam as what we've seen with other MLMs on previous episodes. If the company has to resort to deceitful tactics to win you over, then they're not a company worth joining. And hey, given their history of not paying what they claim, it seems like any other place with a set in stone paycheck is a better option. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of Multi-Level Mondays. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing wherever you're hearing this so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I upload every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to make sure that you can get fresh information throughout the week. Thank you so much for listening to another Multi-Level Mondays, and I'll see you in the next one. 